Considerations by the way. Hear what British Merlin sung of keenest eye and truest tongue. Say not the chiefs who first arrive usurp the seats for which all strive. The forefathers this land who found failed to plant the vantage ground. Ever from one who comes tomorrow, men wait their good and truth to borrow. But wilt thou measure all thy road? See thou lift the lightest load. Who has little to him who has less can spare? And thou, Sindelin son, beware, ponderous gold and stuffs to bear, to falter ere thou thy task fulfill. Only the light armed climb the hill. The richest of all lords is use, and ready health the loftiest muse. Live in the sunshine, swim the sea, drink the wild air's salubrity. Where the star canopy shines in May, shepherds are thankful and nations gay. The music that can deepest reach and cure all ill is cordial speech. Mass I wisdom with delight, toy with a bow, yet hit the white. Of all what's use, the main one is to live well with one who has none. Cleave to thine acre, the round year, will fetch all fruits and virtues here. Fool and fool may harmless roam, loved and lovers bide at home. A day for toil, an hour for sport, but for a friend is life too short. Although this garrulity of advising is born with us, I confess that life is rather a subject of wonder than of didactics. So much fate, so much irresistible dictation from temperament and unknown inspiration enters into it, that we doubt we can say anything out of our own experience whereby to help each other. All the professions are timid and expectant agencies. The priest is glad if his prayers or his services meet the condition of any soul. If of two, if of ten, tis a signal success. But he walked to the church without any assurance that he knew the distemper or could heal it. The physician prescribes hesitantly out of his few resources the same tonic or sedative to his new and particular constitution, which he has applied with various success to a hundred men before. If the patient mends, he is glad and surprised. The lawyer advises the client and tells his story to the jury and leaves it with them and is as gay and as much relieved as the client if it turns out he has a verdict. The judge weighs the arguments and puts a brave face in the matter, and since there must be a decision, decides as he can, and hopes he has done justice and given satisfaction to the community, but is only an advocate after all. And so is all of life timid and unskillful spectator. We do what we must and call it by the best names. We like very well to be praised for our action, but our conscience says not unto us. There's little we can do for each other. We accompany the youth with sympathy, and manifold old sayings of the wise, to the gate of the arena, but it's certain that not by strength of ours, or by the old sayings, but only by strength of his own, unknown to any of us, he must stand or fall. By which a man conquers in any passage is a profound secret to every other being in the world, and it is only as he turns his back on us all and all men, and draws on his most private wisdom, that any good can come up to him. What we have, therefore, to say of life is rather a description, or if you please, celebration, than available rules. Yet vigor is contagious, and whatever makes us either think or feel strongly adds to our power and enlarges our field of action. We have a debt to every great heart, to every fine genius, to those who have put life and fortune on the cast of an act of justice, to those who have added new sciences, to those who have refined life by elegant pursuits. Tis the fine souls who serve us, not what is called fine society. Fine society is only a self-protection against the vulgarities of the street and the tavern. Fine society, in the common acceptation, has neither ideas nor aims. It renders the service of a perfumery or laundry, not of a farm or factory. Tis an exclusion in a precinct. Sidney Smith said, A few yards in London cement or dissolve friendship. It's unprincipled decorum an affair of clean linens and coaches, of gloves, cards, and elegances and trifles. There are other measures of self-respect for a man than the number of clean shirts he puts on every day. Society wishes to be amused. I do not wish to be amused. I wish that life should not be cheap, but sacred. I wish the days to be cent as centuries, loaded, fragrant. Now we reckon them as bank days, by some debt which is to be paid us, or which we are to pay, or some pleasure we are to taste is all we have to draw, do is draw the breath in and blow it out again? Porphyry's definition is better. Life is that which hold matter together. The babe in arms is a channel through which the energies we call fate, love, and reason visibly stream. See what a commentary of train of auxiliaries man carries with him, of animals, plants, stones, gases, and imponderable elements. Let us infer his ends from the pomp of means. Mirabu said, 
Why should we feel ourselves to be men, unless we succeed in everything, everywhere? We must say of nothing that is beneath me, nor feel that anything can be out of your power. Nothing is impossible to man who can will. Is that necessary? That shall be. This is the only law of success. Whoever said it, this is the right key. But this is not the tone and genius of the men of the street. In the streets, we grow cynical. The men we meet are coarse and torpid. The finest wits have their sediment. What quantities of fribbles, paupers, invalids, epicures, antiquaries, politicians, thieves, and triflers of both sexes might be advantageously spared. Mankind divides itself into two classes, benefactors and malefactors. The second class is vast, the first a handful. A person seldom falls sick, but the bystanders are animated with the faint hope that he will die. Quantities of poor lives, of distressing invalids, of cases for a gun. Franklin said, mankind are but very superficial and dastardly. They begin upon a thing, but, meeting with a difficulty, they fly from it discouraged. But they have capacities, if they would employ them. Shall we then judge a country by the majority, or by the minority? By the minority, surely. Tis pedantry to estimate nations by the census, or by square miles of land, or other than by the importance of the mind of the time. Leave this hypocritical prating about the masses. Masses are rude, lame, unmade, pernicious in the demands and influence, and need not be flattered but to be schooled. I wish not to concede anything to them, but to tame, drill, divide, and break them up, to draw individuals out of them. The worst of charity is that, though the lies you are asked to preserve are not worth preserving. Masses, the clam that is the masses, I do not wish any masses at all, but honest men only. Lovely, sweet, accomplished women only, a no shovel handed, narrow brained, gin drinking, million stockingers, and Lazaranoni only. If government knew how, I would like to see it check, not multiply, the population. When it reaches its true law of action, every man that is born will be hailed as essential. Away with this hurrah of masses, and let us have the considerate vote of a single man spoken on their honor and their conscience. In old Egypt, it was established law that the vote of a prophet reckoned equal to a hundred hands. I think it was much underestimated. Clay and clay differ in dignity, as we discover by our preferences every day. What a vicious practice is this of our politicians at Washington pairing off, as if one man who votes wrong going away could excuse you, who mean to vote right for going away, or as if your presence did not tell more ways than in your vote. Suppose that three hundred heroes at Thermopylae had paired off with three hundred Persians. Would it have been all the same to Greece and to history? Napoleon was called by his men Saint Mill. Added honestly, they might have called him Hundred Million. Nature makes fifty poor melons for one that is good, and shakes down a tree full of gnarled, wormy, unripe crabs before you can find a dozen desert apples. She scatters nations of naked Indians and nations of clothed Christians, with two or three good hens among them. Nature works very hard, and only hits the white once in a million throws. In mankind, she is contented if she yields one master in a century. The more difficulty there is in creating good men, the more they are used when they come. I once counted in a little neighborhood and found that every able-bodied man had, say, from twelve to fifteen persons depend on him for material aid, to whom he is to be for a spoon and jug, for backer and sponsor, for nursery and hospital, and many functions besides. Nor does it seem to make much difference whether he is a bachelor or a patriarch. If he do not violently decline the duties that fall to him, this amount of helpfulness will in one way or another be brought home to him. This is the tax which his abilities pay. The good men are employed for private centers of use and for larger influence. All revelations, whether of mechanical or intellectual or moral science, are made not to communities but to single persons. All the marked events of our day, all the cities, all the colonizations, may be traced back to their origin in a private brain. All the feats which make our civility were the thoughts of a few good heads. Meantime, this spawning productivity is not noxious nor needless. You would say this rabble of nations might be spared, but no, they are all counted and depended on. Fate keeps everything alive so long as the small set of public necessity holds it on the tree. The coxcomb and bully and thief class are allowed to be proletaries every one of their vices being the excess or crudity of a virtue. The masses are animal, in pupillage, and near chimpanzee. By the units, whereof this mass is composed are neuters, every one to which may be grown up to be a queen bee. The rule is, we are used as brute atoms until we think. Then we use all the rest. Nature turns all malfeasance to good. Nature provides for real needs. No sane man is at last to distrust himself. His existence is a perfect answer to all sentimental cavils. 
If he is, he is wanted, and has the precise properties that are required. That we are here is proof we ought to be here. We have a good right, and the same sort of right to be here, as Cape Cod or Sandy Hook or to, the, to be here. To say that the majority are wicked means no malice, no bad heart in the observer, but simply that the majority are unripe, and have not yet come to themselves, and do not know their opinion. That, if they knew it, is an oracle for them and for all. But in the passing moment, that quadrupede interest is very prone to prevail, and this beast force, whilst it makes the discipline of the world, the school of heroes, the glory of martyrs, has provoked in every age the satire of wits and the tears of good men. They find the journals, the clubs, the governments, the churches to be in the interests of the pay of the devil. And a wise man have met this obstruction in their times, like Socrates with his famous irony, like Bacon with his lifelong dissimulation, like Erasmus with his book The Praise of Folly, like Rabale and his satire rending the nations. They were the fools who cried against me, you will say, wrote the Chevier de Bouffle at Grimm. Eh, but the fools have the advantage of numbers, and tis they which decides. Tis of no use for us to make war with them. They will not weaken them. They will always be the masters. There will not be the practice or any usage introduced which they are not the authors. In front of these sinister facts, the first lesson of history is the good of evil. Good is a good doctor, but bad is sometimes a better. Tis the oppressions of William the Norman, savage forest laws, the crushing despotism, that made possible the inspirations of Magna Carta under John. Edward I wanted money, armies, castles, as much as he could get. It was necessary to call the people together by shorter, swifter ways, and the House of Commons arose. To obtain subsidies, he paid in privileges. In the twenty-fourth year of his reign, he decreed that no tax should be levied without the consent of Lords of Commons, which is the basis of the English Constitution. Plutarch affirms that the cruel wars which followed the march of Alexander introduced the civility, language, and arts of Greece into the savage East, introduced marriage, built seventy cities, and united hostile nations under one government. The barbarians who broke up the Roman Empire did not arrive a day too soon. Schiller says the Thirty Year War made Germany a nation. Rough, selfish despots served men immensely, as Henry the Eighth, in the contest with the Pope, as the infatuations no less than the wisdoms, Cromwell, as the ferocity of the Russian Tsars, as the fanaticism of the French regicides of the seventeen eighty nine. The frost which kills a harvest of a year saves a harvest of a century, by destroying the weevil or the locust. Wars, fires, plagues, break up immovable routine, clear the ground of rotten races and dens in December, and open fair fields to new men. There is a tendency in things to right themselves, and the war of revolution or bankruptcy that shatters the rotten system allows things to take a new and natural order. The sharpest evils are bent into the periodicity which makes the errors of planets and the fevers and distempers of men self-limiting. Nature is upheld by antagonism. Passions, resistance, danger are educators. We acquire the strength we have overcome. Without war, no soldier. Without enemies, no hero. The sun were insipid if the universe were not opaque. And the glory of the character is in affronting the horrors of depravity, to draw thence new abilities of power. As art lives and thrills in new use and combining of contrasts, in mining into the dark ever for for blacker pits of night. What would painter do, or what would poet or saint, but for crucifixions and hells? Nevermore in the world is this marvelous balance of beauty and disgust, magnificence and rats. Not Antoninus, but a poor washerwoman said, The more trouble, the more lion. That's my principle. I do not think very respectively of the designs or the doings of the people who went to California in 1849. It was a rush and a scramble of needy adventurers, and in the western country a general jail delivery of all the rowdies of the rivers. Some of them went with honest purposes, some with very bad ones, and all of them with a very com commonplace wish to find a short way to wealth. But nature watches over all, and turns this malfeasance to good. California gets peopled and subdued, civilized in this immoral way, and on this fiction, a real prosperity is rooted and grown. Tis a decoy duck, tis tubs thrown to amuse the whales, but real ducks and whales that yield oil are caught, and out of the Sabine rapes, out of the robbers' forays, real roams and their heroisms come in fullness of time. In America, the geography is sublime, but the men are not. The inventions are excellent, but, but the inventor is one is sometimes ashamed of. The agencies by which events so grand as the opening of California, of Texas, of Oregon, the junctions of the two oceans are affected are paltry. Coarse selfishness, fraud, and conspiracy. Most of the great results of history are brought about by discreditable means. 
The benefaction derived in Illinois and the Great West from railroads is inestimable, and vastly exceeding any intentional philanthropy on record. What is the benefit done by a good King Alfred, or by Howard, or Pestalozzi, or Elizabeth Fry, or Florence Nightingale, or any lever, lesser or larger, compared to the involuntary blessing wrought on nations by the selfish capitalists who built the Illinois, Michigan, the network of the Mississippi Valley roads, which have evoked not only all the wealth of the soil, but the energy of millions of men? Tis the sentence of ancient wisdom that God hangs the greatest weights on the smallest wires. What happens thus to nations befalls every day in private houses, when the friends of a gentleman brought to us notice the follies of his sons, with many hints of their danger, he replied that he knew so much mischief when he was a boy, and had turned out in the whole so successfully that he was not alarmed by the dissipation of boys. Twas dangerous water, but he thought they would soon touch bottom and then swim to the top. This is bold practice, and there are many failures to a good escape, yet one would say that a good understanding would suffice as well as moral sensibility to keep one erect. The gratifications of the passions are so quickly seen to be damaging in what men like Lise seriously lowering them in social rank, when all talent sinks with character. Que moi, le si le toi, said Voltaire, we see those who surmount, by dint of some egotism or infatuation, obstacles from which the prudent recoil. The right partic partisan is a heady, narrow man who, because he does not see many things, sees w some one thing with heat and exaggeration. And if he falls among other narrow men, or on objects which have a brief importance, or some trade or politics of the hour, he prefers it to the universe, and seems inspired, and a godsend to those who wish to magnify the matter and carry a point. Better certainly if he could secure the strength and fire which rude passionate men bring into society, quite clear to their vices, but who dares draw out the linchpin from the wagon wheel, tis so manifest that there is no moral deformity, but is a good passion out of place, that there is no man who is not indebted to his foibles, that according to the old oracle the furies are the bonds of men, that the poisons of our principal medicines, that ki which kills the disease and saves the life. In the high prophetic phrase, he causes the wrath of men to praise him, and twists and wrenches are evil to our good. Shakespeare wrote, "'Tis said, best men are molded by their faults." And great educators and lawgivers, and especially generals and leaders of colonies, mainly rely on this stuff, and esteem men of irregular and impassional force the best timber. A man of sense and energy, the, great, the late head of the farm school in Boston Arbor, said to me, "'I want none of your good boys. Give me your bad ones.' And this is the reason, I suppose, why, as soon as children are good, the mothers are scared, and think they are going to die. Mirabeau said, There are none but men of strong passions capable of going to greatness, none but some capable of meriting the public gratitude. Passion, though a bad regulator, is a powerful spring. Any absorbing passion has the effect to deliver from the little coils and cares of everyday life. Tis the heat which sets our human atoms spinning overcomes the friction of crossing thresholds and first addresses in society and gives us a good start and speed easy to continue when once it is begun in short there is no man who is not at some time indebted to his vices as no plant that is not fed from manures we only insist that the man meliorate that the plant grow upward and convert the base into the better nature the wise workman will not regret the poverty of the solitude which brought him out his working talents youth is charmed with the fine air and accomplishments of the children of fortune, but all great men come out of the middle classes. Tis better for the head, tis better for the heart. Marcus Antonina said that Fronto told him that the so-called high-born are for the most part heartless. Whilst nothing is so indicative of deep culture as a tender consideration of the ignorant. Charles James Fox said of England, the history of this country proves that we are not to expect from men in affluent circumstances the vigilance, energy, and exhortation without the House of Commons would lose its greatest force and weight. Human nature is prone to indulgence, and the most meritorious public services have always been performed by persons in a condition of life removed from opulence. Yet what we ask daily is to be conventional. Suppose, most kind gods, this defect in my addresses, in my form, in my fortunes, which puts me a little out of the ring. Supply it, and let me be the like the rest whom I admire, and on good terms with them. But the wise gods say, No, we have better things for thee. By humiliations, by defeats, by loss of sympathy, by gulfs of disparity, learn a wider truth in humanity than that of the fine gentleman. A Fifth Avenue landlord, a West End and householder, is not the highest style of man. And though good hearts and sound minds are of no condition, yet he who is to be wise for many must not be protected. 
You must know that huts where met poor men lie, and the chores which poor men do. The first-class minds, Aesop, Socrates, Cervantes, Shakespeare, Franklin, had the poor man's feelings of mortification. A rich man was never insulted in his life, but this man must be stung. A rich man was never in danger from cold, or hunger, or war, or ruffians, and you can see he was not, for the moderation of his ideas. Tis a fatal disadvantage to be cockered, and to eat too much cake. What test of manhood could he stand? Take him out of his protections. He is a good bookkeeper, or is a shrewd adviser in the insurance office. Perhaps he could pass a college examination and take his degrees. Perhaps he can give wise counsel in a court of law. Now plant him down among farmers, firemen, Indians, and immigrants. Set a dog upon him. Set a highwayman on him. Try him with a course of mobs. Send him to Kansas, to Pikes Peak, to Oregon. And if you have true faculty, this may be the element he wants, and he will come out of it with broader wisdom and manly power. Aesop, Sadi, Cervantes, Regnard have been taken by corsairs, left for dead, sold for slaves, and known the realities of human life. Bad times have a scientific value. They are occasions a good learner would not miss. So we go gladly to Fainal Hall, to be played upon by the stormy winds and strong fingers of enraged patriotism. So is a fanatical persecution, civil war, national bankruptcy, or revolution, more rich in the central tones than languid years of prosperity. What had been, ever since our memory's solid contentment, yawns apart and discloses its composition and genesis. We learn geology the morning after the earthquake, on ghastly diagrams of cloven mountains, upheaved plains, and the dry bed of the sea. In our life and culture, everything is worked up and comes in use. Passion, war, revolt, bankruptcy, and not less folly and blunders, insult, ennui, and the bad company. Nature is a rag merchant who worked up every shred and ort and end into new creations. Like a good chemist whom I found the other day in his laboratory, converting his old shirts into pure white sugar. Life is a boundless privilege, and when you pay for your ticket, you get into the car and have no guess what good company you shall find there. You buy much that is not rendered in the bill. Men achieve a certain greatness unawares when working to another aim. If now in this connection of discourse we should venture on striking down the first obvious rules of life, I will not here repeat the first lines of economy, already propounded once and again, that every man shall maintain himself, but I will say, good get health. No labor, pains, temperance, poverty, nor exercise can gain it, it must be grudged. For sickness is a cannibal which eats up all the life and youth it can hold, lay hold of, and absorbs its own sons and daughters. I figure it as a pale, wailing, distracted phantom, absolutely selfish, heedless of what is good and great, attentive to its sensations, losing its soul and afflicting other souls with meanness and mopings, and with ministrations of its ferocity of trifles. Dr. Johnson said severely, Every man is a rascal as soon as he is sick. Drop the can, treat it sanely. In dealing with the drunken, we do not affect to be drunk. We must treat the sick with the same firmness, giving them, of course, every aid, but withholding ourselves. I once asked a clergyman in a retired town, who were his companions, what men of ability he saw. He replied that he spent his time with the sick and the dying. I said he seemed to me to need quite other company, and all the more that he had this, for if people were sick and dying to any purpose, he would leave all and go to them. But as far as I have observed, they were as frivolous as the rest, and sometimes much more frivolous. Let us engage our companions not to spare us. I knew a wise woman who said to her friends, When I am old, rule me. And the best part of health is fine disposition. It is more essential than talent, even in the works of talent. Nothing will supply the want of sunshine to peaches. And to make knowledge valuable, you must have the cheerfulness of wisdom. Whenever you are sincerely pleased, you are nourished. The joy of the spirit indicates its strength. All healthy things are sweet-tempered. Genius works in sport, and goodness smiles at the last. And for that reason, that whoever sees the law, which distributes things, does not despond, but is animated in great desires and endeavors. He who desponds betrays that he has not seen it. Tis a Dutch proverb that paint costs nothing, such are its preserving qualities in damp climates. Well, sunshine costs less, and is a finer pigment. And so of cheerfulness, or a good temper, the more of it spent, the more of it remains. The latent heat of one ounce of wood or a stone is inexhaustible. You may rub the same chip of pine to the point of kindling, a hundred times, and the power of happiness of any soul is not to be computed or drained. It is observed that a depression of spirits develops the germ of a plague in individuals and nations. It is an old commendation of right behavior. Ali late sapiens sabi, which our English proverb translates, be merry and wise. 
I know how easy it is to turn men of the world to look grave and sneer at your sanguine youth and its glittering dreams, but I find the gayest castles in the air that were ever piled far better for comfort and for use than the dungeons in the air that are daily dug and caverned about by the grumbling, discontented people. I know those miserable fellows, and I hate them, who see a black star always riding through the light and colored clouds in the sky overhead. Waves of light pass over and hide it for the moment, but the black star keeps fast in the zenith. But power dwells with cheerfulness. Hope puts on a working mood, while despair is no muse, and untunes the active powers. A man should make life and nature happier to us, or he had better never been born. When the political economist reckons up the unproductive classes, he should put out the head of this class the pitiers of themselves, cravers of sympathy, bewailing imaginary disasters. An old French verse runs in my translations, Some of your griefs you have cured, and the sharpest you have survived. What torments of pain you have endured from evils that never arrived. There are three wants which never can be satisfied. That of the rich, who wants something more. That of the sick, who wants something different. That of the traveler, who says, anywhere but here. The Turkish Cadiz said of Layard, after the fashion of the people, Thou hast wandered from one place to another, until thou art happy and content in none. My countrymen are not less infatuated with the Rococo toy of Italy. All America seems on the point of embarking for Europe. We should not always traverse seas and lands with light purposes and for pleasure, as we say. One day we shall cast out the passion for Europe by the passion for America. Culture will to give gravity and domestic rest to those who now travel only as not knowing how else to spend money. Already who provoke pity like that excellent family party just arriving in their well-appointed carriage, as far from home and any honor as ever? Each nation has asked successfully, what are they here for? until at last the party are shamefaced and anticipate the question at the gates of each town. Genial manners are good, and powers of accommodation to any circumstance, but the high price of life, the crowning fortune of a man is to be born with a bias to some pursuit, which finds him in employment and happiness, whether it be to make baskets, or broadswords, or canals, or statutes, or songs. I doubt not this is the meaning of Socrates when he pronounced artists to be the only truly wise as being actually not apparently so. In childhood we fancied ourselves walled in by the horizons, as by a glass bell, and doubted not, by distant travels, we should reach the baths of the setting sun and stars. On the experiment, the horizon flies before us, and leaves us on an endless common, sheltered by no glass bell. Yet tis strange how tenaciously we cling to the bell astronomy of a protective domestic horizon. I find the same illusion in the search after happiness, which I observe every summer, recommenced in this neighborhood, soon after the pairing of the birds. Young people do not like the town, do not like the seashore, they will go inland, find a dear cottage deep in the mountains, secreted as their hearts. They set forth on their travels in search of a home. They reach Berkshire, they reach Vermont, they look at the farms, good farms, high mountain sides, but where is the seclusion? The farm is near this, tis near that. They have got far from Boston, but tis but near Albany, or near Burlington, or near Montreal. They explore a farm, but the house is small, old, thin. Discontented people live there and are gone. There's too much sky, too much outdoors, too public. The youth aches for solitude. When he comes to the house, he passes through the house. What does not make the deep recess he sought? Oh, now I perceive, he says, it must be deep with persons. Friends only can give depth. Yes, but there's a great dearth this year of friends. Hard to find and hard to have when found. They are just going away. They are two in the world, the flitting world, and have engagements and necessities. They are just starting for Wisconsin, have letters from Bremen. See you again soon. Slow, slow to learn the lesson, that there is but one depth, but one interior, and that is his purpose. When joy or calamity or genius shall show it to him, then woods, then farms, then city shopmen and cab drivers, indifferently with prophet or friend, will bring back to him his unfathomable heaven, his populous solitude. The uses of travel are occasional and short, but the best fruit it finds, when it finds it, is conversation. And this is a main function of life. What a difference in the hospitality of minds. Inestimable is he whom we can say what we cannot say to ourselves. Others are involuntarily hurtful to us, and bereave us of the power of thought, impound and imprison us. As when there is sympathy, there needs to be one wise man in company, and all are wise. So a blockhead makes a blockhead of his companion. Wonderful power to be numb possesses this brother. When he comes in the office of public room, the society dissolves. One after another slip out, and the apartment is at his disposal. What is incurable but a frivolous habit? A fly is as untamable as a hyena. 
Yet folly in the sense of fun, fooling or dawdling, can easily be born. As Talliard said, I find non nonsense singularly refreshing. But a virulent, aggressive fool taints the reason of a household. I have seen a whole family of quiet, sensible people unhinged and beside themselves, victim of such a rogue. For the steady wrong-headedness of one perverse person irritates the best. Since we must withstand absurdity, but resistance only exasperates the acrid fool, and believes the nature and gravitation were quite wrong, and he only is right. Once all the dozen inmates are soon perverted, with whatever virtues and industries they have, into contradictors, accusers, explainers, and repairers of this one malefactor, like a boat about to be overset, or a carriage run away with, not only the foolish pilot or driver, but everyone on board is forced to assume strange and ridiculous attitudes, to balance the vehicle and prevent the upsetting. For remedy, whilst the case is yet mild, I recommend phlegm and truth. Let all the truth that is spoken or done be at zero or of, ind of indifferency, or truth itself will be folly. But when the case is seated and malignant, the only safety is an amputation. As seamen say, you shall cut and run. How to live with unfit companions, for with such life is the most part spent. And experience teaches little better than our earliest instinct for self-defense, namely, not to engage, not to mix yourself in any manner with them, but let their madness spend itself unopposed. You are you, and I am I. Conversation is an art in which a man has all mankind for his competitors, for it is that which we are all practicing every day while they live. Our habit of thought, take men as they arise, is not satisfying. In the common experience, I fear, it is poor and squalid. The success which will content them is a bargain, a lucrative employment, an advantage gained over a competitor, a marriage, a patrimony, a legacy, and the like. With these objects, their conversation deals with surfaces, politics, trade, personal defects, exaggerated bad news, and the rain. This is forlorn, and they feel sore and sensitive. Now if one comes who can illuminate this dark house with thoughts, show them their native riches, what gifts they have, how indispensable each is, what magical powers over nature and men, what access to poetry, religion, and the powers which constitute character, he wakes in them the feelings of worth, his suggestions acquire new ways of living, new books, new men, new arts and sciences. Then we come out of our eggshell existence in this great dome, and see the zenith over and the nadir under us. Instead of the tanks and buckets of knowledge to which we are daily confined, we come down to the shore of the sea and dip our hands in its miraculous waves. Tis wonderful the effect on the company. They are not the men they were. They all have been to California and all have come back millionaires. There is no book and no pleasure in life comparable to it. Ask what is best in our experience and we shall say a few pieces of plain dealing with wise men. Our conversation once and again has apprised us of what we belong to better circles than we have yet beheld, that a mental power invites us, whose generalizations are worth more joy and for effect than anything that is now called philosophy or literature. In excited conversation we have glimpses of the universe, hints of power native to the soul, far darting lights and shadows in the Andes landscape, such as we can hardly attain in lone meditation. Here are oracles, sometimes profusely given, to which the memory goes back in barren hours. Add the consent of will and temperament, and there exists the covenant of friendship. Our chief want in life is somebody who shall make us do what we can. This is the service of a friend. With him we are easily great. There is a sublime attraction in him to whatever virtue is in us. How he flings wide the doors of existence. What questions we ask of him. What an understanding we have. How few words are needed. It is the only real society. An Eastern poet, Ali ben Abu Talib, writes with sad truth, He who has a thousand friends has not a friend to spare, and he who has one enemy shall meet him everywhere. But few writers have said anything better to this point than Hafiz, who indicates this relation as the test of mental health. Thou learnest no secret until thou knowest friendship, since the unsound no heavenly knowledge enters. Neither is life long enough for friendship. That is a serious and majestic affair, like a royal presence, or a religion, and not a postillion's dinner to be eaten on the run. There is a pudency about friendship, as about love, and though fine souls never lose sight of it, they do not name it. With the first class of men our friendship or good understanding goes quite behind all accidents of estrangement, of condition or reputation. And yet we do not provide for the great, greatest good of life. We take care of our health, we lay up money, we make our roof tight and our clothing sufficient. But who provides wisely that he shall not be wanting in the best property of all? Friends. We know that all our training is to fit us for this, and we do not take the steps towards it. How long we sit and wait for those benefactors. 
It makes no difference that looking back five years, how you have dieted and dressed, whether you've been lodged in the first floor of the attic, whether you've had gardens or baths, good cattle or horses, have been carried in a neat equipage or in a ridiculous truck, these things are forgotten so quickly and have leave no effect. But it counts much whether you have had good companions in that time, almost as much as what we have been doing, and see the overpowering importance of neighborhood and all association. As it is marriage, fit or unfit, that makes our home, so it is who lives near us of equal social degree. A few people at convenient distance, no matter how bad company, these and these only, shall be your life's companions. And all those who are native, congenial, and by many an oath of the heart, sacramented to you, are gradually and totally lost. You cannot deal systematically with this fine element of society. The one may take a good deal of pains to bring people together, and to organize clubs and debating societies, yet no results come of it. But it is certain that there is a great deal of good in us that does not know itself, and that a habit of union and competition brings people up and keeps them up to their highest point. But life would be twice or ten times life if spent with wise and fruitful companions. The obvious inference is a little use, full of deliberation and preconcert, and one goes to buy a house and land. But we live with people on other platforms. We live with dependents, and only with the young who we are to teach all we know and clothe with the advantage we have earned, but also with those who serve us directly and for money. Yet the old rules hold good. Let not the tie be mercenary, though the service is measured by money. Make yourself necessary to somebody. Do not make life hard to any. This point is acquiring new importance in American social life. Our domestic service is usually a foolish fracas of unreasonable demand on one side and shirking on the other. A man of wit was asked in the train, what was his errand in the city? He replied, I have been sent to procure an angel to do cooking. A lady complained to me that, of her two maidens, one was absent-minded and the other absent-bodied, and the evil increases from the ignorance and hostility of every shipload of the immigrant population swarming into houses and farms. Few people discern that it rests with the master of the mistress what service comes from the man or the maid. That this identical hussy was a tutelar spirit in one house, and a harridan in the other. All sensible people are selfish, and nature is tugging at every contract to make the terms of it fair. If you are proposing only your own, the other party must deal a little hardly with you. If you deal generously, the other, though selfish and unjust, will make an exception in your favor and deal truly with you. When I asked an iron master about the slag and cinder and railroad iron, oh, he said, there's always good iron to be had. If there's cinder in the iron, tis because there was cinder in the pay. But why multiply this topic and their illustrations, which are endless? Life brings to each his task, and whatever art you select, algebra, planting, architecture, poems, commerce, politics, all are attainable, even to the miraculous triumphs on the same terms of selecting that for you which you are apt. Begin at the beginning, proceed in order, step by step, Tis as easy to twist iron anchors and braid cannon as to braid straw, to boil granite, or to boil water, if you take all the steps in order. Wherever there is failure, there is some giddiness, some superstition about luck, some step omitted, which nature never pardons. The happy conditions of life may be had on the same terms. Their attraction for you is the pledge that you are within their reach. Our prayer are prophets. There must be fidelity. There must be adherence. How respectable the life that clings to its objects. Youthful aspirations are fine things. Your theories and plans of life are fair and commensable. But will you stick? Not one I fear in the common full of people, or in a thousand but one. And when you tax them with treachery and remind them of their high resolutions, they have forgotten they have made a vow. The individuals are fugitive, in the act of becoming something else, and irresponsible. The race is great, the ideal fair, but the men whiffling and unsure. The hero is he who is immovably centered. The main difference between people seems to be that one man can become under obligations on which you can rely, is obligeable, and the other is not. As he has not a law within him, there is nothing to tie him to. Tis inevitable to name particulars of virtue and of condition and to exaggerate them, but all rests at last on the integrity which dwarfs talent and can spare it. Sanity consists in being not subdued by your means. Fancy prices are paid for position, and for the culture of talent, but to the grand interest, superficial success is of no account. The man, it is his attitude, not feats, but forces, not on set days and public occasions, but at all hours, and in repose alike as an energy, still formidable, not to be disposed of. The populace says, with horn took, if you would be powerful, pretend to be powerful. I prefer to say with the old prophet, seekest thou great things? Seek them not. 
or what was said of the Spanish prince. The more you took from him, the greater he looked. Plus un luyote, plus un il es grande. The secret of culture is to learn that a few great points steadily reappear, alike in the poverty of the obscure farm and the miscellany of the metropolitan life, and these few are alone to be regarded. The escape from all false ties, courage to be what you are, and love of what is simple and beautiful, independence and cheerful relation, these are the essentials, these and the wish to serve, to add somewhat to the well-being of men.